speaker in this session uh, is another member of the school uh, faculty, but may not be as well known to uh, as many of you. Jerry Bernard joined the school this year. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD in health behavioral research at USC's Tech School of Medicine, a well known to many, uh, a fine institution. And, uh, and uh, did postdoctoral training at uh, UCLA and the Rand Corporation. Jerry is studying how memories act on decision making processes and how to develop interventions that take advantage of these implicit memory processes. He's helped apply these principles to the study of obesity, substance abuse, and HIV risk behavior. He'll talk today about ecological momentary assessment, measuring cue-induced eating among adolescents. Thank you, Larry. Um, I was looking at this title sitting over there, and I was thinking, boy, I've got to do a better job and make these more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what we're going to try and talk about today. Uh, just quickly, uh, some uh, the investigative team, this project that I'm working on, uh, Kim Reynolds is the guy who just heard speak, and with sig significant input from uh, Alan Stacy and Susan Ames, and I'm grateful for them asking me to uh, come participate in this research. So. What I'm going to go through today is what did we want to study among adolescents and their eating behaviors? Uh, what is EMA? And how would we be using EMA uh, in this project? So the kind of the overriding question is how do, how do uh, youth decide what they're going to eat? And in this particular study, we're mainly interested in what they would be eating when they had the choice. Uh, when they came home from school and they were choosing what snacks to eat, how would they, what would they choose to eat? Not necessarily what would happen at meals where uh, the parents would be deciding what would be uh, prepared. So, like all of us, they uh, probably look in the fridge, see what's in there, see what they might want to eat. And so our question is, how do they decide then what, they, what they're going to eat? I want to thank James for some of these images. <laughs> uh, so this, I want to talk a little bit about the model of decision making. And this comes from uh, some colleagues that uh, we've worked with some at USC, um, Damasio and uh, Becerra. And we're talking about a situation and a behavior. And there are two, basically two polls that have come out of basic research. This particular one comes out of neuroscience, but very similar uh, techniques or processes have been discovered or found in cognitive science and in basic social psychology and um, even in economics. So this first one, this path A, is more of a traditional method that you see in decision making uh, where a situation occurs and we think about the facts and the options for decisions and what might happen with future outcomes and use certain reasoning strategies to come up with a behavior. This is what we traditionally think of as decision making. So there's another process shown here which is this situation, the cues in the environment, for example the built environment or uh, other cues from the environment, uh, co covertly activate biases uh, that are both related to emotions, emotional experiences, and other situations that have occurred in the past. And I want to uh, spend a little more time on that and talk about the three, three examples of how that can influence decisions. There's the one, that, one arrow that points directly at behavior. And to think of a situation of that, imagine a uh, line drive hit toward a, an outfielder. And just like that, she, she, she dives for the ball and catches the ball. She doesn't stop to think what the options are or anything like that. She just does the behavior immediately. Um, and how does that happen? Well, there's the cue. There's the line drive hit directly in her direction. Um, there's the past behavior, which is a lot of practice, of course. So we have some motor learning going on there. And then there's, um, there's also the emotion tied to it. She's had uh, praise from parents, from coaches. Uh, she hears the cheers of the crowd, the cheers of her 
you know, teammates. So there's uh, all of these things are wrapped up in that in that behavior. Uh, some other ways this happens. Uh, the arrow that points to the options for decisions. Um, our biases and our past experiences can actually influence what options we even consider in making a decision. I do this all the time. I think I'm making a rational decision. I've examined two or three options, made a decision and did it. And my wife comes up and says, well, why don't you think of this? <laughs> um, of course, she's right. <laughs> I just didn't, it just didn't come to mind. So, so that's another way. Another way is uh, reasoning strategies. Uh, again, I use myself. Uh, certain certain things push my buttons, and I just react emotionally very strongly, and uh, just can't think. Just can't think anymore. So, uh, very poor um, decision making skills at that time. Uh, so we find that sometimes behaviors are healthy, and sometimes they're not so healthy. So we want to understand. Uh, the cues in the environment that are uh, affecting us. And so we understand what covertly influences uh, behaviors among youth. And we're looking at cue, outcome, associations, and memory. And just as one example, there are many examples. Uh, but one example is uh, maybe positive associations that may occur between eating healthy foods and spending time with your family at meals, for example. So you can imagine a situation where eating these healthy foods with your family, you start to get this uh, warm feeling about healthy foods. And later in your life, you, you choose to eat healthy foods because you've had these good experiences. And you don't even realize that that's why you're choosing, you may not realize uh, why you've had these good experiences. Uh, so associations and memory, uh, how do we measure these key associations? That's, that's, a, that's a difficult problem. Uh, because these implicit associations are typically spontaneous or automatic, and we, and we typically don't really uh, realize what they're doing. Uh, they're unavailable to introspection, uh, we might say, which makes standard surveys uh, would be not very useful, and especially retrospective surveys. Why did you do something in the past 30 days or the six months? It uh, becomes very difficult for someone to introspect into that. So this is where the ecological momentary assessment comes in. Uh, we're trying to measure behaviors closer to the event so that we can get closer to what is, what is really uh, causing behavior. And uh, one way of doing that is have observers go, say, to the trails, uh, collect data right at the trails while the behavior is, is underway. Or in this example, uh, sun protection on beaches. And they just go out there, see what people are doing, ask them while they're in the behavior, are they wearing sunscreen? Um, another way to do it is to have the participants record their behavior. An example might be a food, um, food journal where they're actually writing down what they had for lunch um, or for dinner or a snack or whatever. And more recently, people are starting to use handheld devices. In our case, we're uh, going to use PDAs, which are a little bit of an older technology, but um, they do work. So in our, in our, in our study, we're, uh, with the PDAs, we're going to have three types of questionnaires. The first is a participant-initiated questionnaire. Uh, the last them when they eat something, to, to go to the PDA and answer a series of 15 or 20 questions. Another questionnaire will happen when, with a random beep. A beep will occur on the on the um, PDA, and then they'll answer questions at that time. So we'll get uh, information from them at the time they're eating, and at the time we hope when they're not eating, we can compare what's in the environment, what's going on, what's happening, what they're doing, and maybe find those uh, cues that are uh, causing some of the eating behaviors. And then we also have an evening report which asks uh, some questions which may not be occurring <coughs> on an hourly basis. <coughs> So, uh, what questions will be asked about eating events? Well, uh, relevant to this study is uh, what are the, what's in the environment? Where are you? What kind of things in the environment might be influencing your behavior? Were you walking by an in-and-out restaurant just before you started to eat? Uh, did you see a telephone? Uh, what were you doing? Were you watching TV? Did you see some commercials that may have influenced you to go uh, make some old Red Locker popcorn or something? Um, who are you with? Sometimes people eat more often with others. How do you feel? Are you 
hungry? So these are the types of questions. Um, then we ask what did you eat and uh, what else was available because you made a choice to eat that instead of something else. Yes. Yeah. So the current study uh, looking at adolescents recruited primarily from Molina Healthcare. Uh, the target of 150, they'll carry the PDA for nine days. Uh, Invigo Data is just the company that's helping us program the devices to, to ask these questions and then to, to manage the data for us as it comes in. Uh, do a pilot in July and the main study in September. So future EMA studies I can see uh, migrating to smartphones which will give us more, more versatility for more applications that we were talking about. And uh, one of the things that, that seems exciting to me about using smartphones is you're not only, you can not only do an intervention, but you can get measurement and immediate feedback on that intervention. And that's, that's one of the problems in, in, in fielding interventions today is, you know, it takes two or three years to get information back. But in more real time, I think you can start getting these, getting feedback, modifying the intervention, and, and uh, maybe uh, working in kind of an interesting area there. So my question is, what's in your fridge? <laughs> and I hope it looks like this. <laughs>